The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Difficult Employees, 15 Types of Employees Who Challenge Us, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Michelle Wilcox and I will be your moderator today. And I will be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed can be found at the URL currently shown on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not control the audio, your devices control the audio, so if you have audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again at the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you're using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we'll be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering the questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number, a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Managing Difficult Employees, 15 Types of Employees Who Challenge Us. Our presenter today is Dr. Steve Albrecht. Dr. Albrecht is a trainer, author, and consulting, uh, I'm sorry, a consultant specializing in complex HR issues and security concerns. He holds a doctorate in business administration, an MA in security management, a BS in psychology, and a BA in English. He is a board certified in HR, security management, employee coaching, and threat management. He has written 24 books on business, service, leadership, security, and criminal justice subjects. That be, thank you again today for being with us, Dr. Albright, and I'm going to turn this over to you now. Thanks, Michelle. Good to be with everybody and happy to talk about these subjects with us today. And let me just get us rocking and rolling. How's that look, Michelle? We're good? Yep, we're good. Thanks, everybody, and thanks to the good folks at Heffernan and also to the great folks over at Aspen Risk Management. I have known them for decades, uh, especially Steve Thompson and, and Phaedra and the good folks over there. So my background in supervision includes working for the city of San Diego as a supervisor for 15 years. But really a lot of these archetypes, and that's what they are, they're archetypes of really challenging types of, of employees comes from my work in coaching. And I have coached a lot of these types of employees. I have coached uh, supervisors, managers, and department directors uh, who have these types of employees working for them and they're quite frustrated. Uh, the issues that we're always looking at are sometimes about performance, but other times it's about behavior. And I'm a strong believer in the concept of the PIP you know, the performance improvement plan versus the BIP, which is the behavior improvement plan. Sometimes we have really shining stars at sales and tech and, and, and client or customer interactions, but not such good people when it comes to their interactions with coworkers or bosses, sarcasm, rudeness, gossiping, things like that. So it is possible that you may have some employees that are working for you that have skills in one area, which they're quite strong in, and that's necessarily performance oriented, but sometimes their behavior is not what we want it to be. So you can create a behavior improvement plan. We'll talk about that as we go forward. So if you look at the title, you know, there's a, there's a, a movement when I think about these types of employees away from the idea of being necessarily difficult all the time, but sometimes they're just challenging a lot. And, and challenging is perhaps a more semantically positive word, which says sometimes these employees just, just get on our last nerve because their quirks and eccentricities and their personality concerns and some ways that they see the world through their particular drinking straw, looking at the large ocean that is the overall world, is different than yours. And, and sometimes they swim upstream intentionally and sometimes they don't realize what they're doing and sometimes they bring some of their past 
issues, either life issues or previous employment issues to your organization. And there's some rough edges and some things that need to be smoothed out. And so I'm a big believer in coaching and the success of employees is based on giving them feedback and not criticism. That's a phrase we'll talk about a lot, the power of feedback as opposed to using the phrase constructive criticism. When we think about who you are dealing with, this may be episodic behavior that you have to address on an occasional basis. It could be all the time. Uh, that's just how they see the world and their personality reflects sometimes in their work habits. So I always think of the reasons why we get involved in coaching conversations. It's about performance. It's about behavior. It is about how we look at it. the employee manages to work within our policies and procedures. It looks at issues around their interactions with coworkers, clients, bosses, taxpayers, customers, vendors, visitors, whoever it happens to be in your organization. It looks at their service orientation. It looks at their ability to work in terms of deadlines and quality of work and, and the type of work that you want from them on an all the time basis. So it is challenging these days if you are managing employees from that are working from home uh, that don't come into your facility and your office on an all the time basis. Um, there's an expectation of work from home employees about their work style and how they choose to do their work these days after we have come out of the pandemic. That's a challenge as well. We look at, at the value of people being able to work effectively in teams and in meetings, uh, staff meetings, uh, specific meetings about, about programs and content and things that they're working on, that they can do that successfully with each other in the, in the meeting environment, not necessarily just online meetings, but face-to-face but -face in the same room as well. So I'm a big believer in, in ground rules uh, for employees, things that you can create for them with each other, ground rules that you can create for your interactions with them. This is what I expect from you, deadlines, delivery, quality of work, things like that, that you enforce using the concept of ground rules. So we'll talk about all these things as we go forward. So the playwright George Bernard Shaw said, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good and not quite all the time. And so I think sometimes one of our frustrations with employees is how we look at the work that we do versus the work that they do and say, why don't they care as much as I do? Uh, I'm a supervisor, I'm a manager, I'm a leader, I'm a department head. I have responsibilities. I have responsibilities from my, my own bosses and I have responsibilities for clients and customers and taxpayers. Why don't the employees care as much as I do? And the answer is they're not paid oftentimes to care as much as you do. You have different responsibilities as an exempt employee. And, and sometimes their, their view of their job is this is a stepping stone to another, another position somewhere else, or it's a stepping stone to a new um, career somewhere else, or it's a transitional job that they're doing until they can get enough money to go back to school or whatever it happens to be. So I think sometimes we can become frustrated when we put our own expectations of quality work and, and interactions and performance on top of people and by comparing it to yourself. And what you need to say is, are they doing the job that we are hiring them for? Are, we, are they following the job descriptions and job duties that we have hired them for? And if the answer is yes, then great. Give them praise, give them support, give them opportunities to succeed. But sometimes we say, why doesn't this person want to promote? Or why doesn't this person want to work as hard as everybody else? And the answer is it's, it's different folks for different folks. The idea that we look at each individual employee as having to be managed separately. Uh, you can't train, teach or, or train everybody the same way. They have different learning styles. You can't supervise or manage everybody the same way. They have different learning styles or different uh, styles that they appreciate or would prefer. So good supervisors, good managers, obviously, know how to change directions for the people that they're dealing with. And that may be necessary in this group that we're talking about. So in, in, the, in the world that we're living in, where diversity and equity and inclusion and belonging are important categories for us to consider as we hire and supervise and promote people, if we look at people bringing their personalities into the workforce, uh, how they decorate their cubicles and how they dress and, and, and what they eat, and music they listen to, and all the things that come from their culture, their personality, their lifestyle. It's really about accepting everybody, but focusing on behavior and, or performance is the two categories that supervisors need, to, to, need to, to concentrate on, which is, you know, I don't care what people look like, I just care what they do. Uh, I, I don't care how people express themselves as long as it's within policy. I just want them to focus on 
work performance or work behavior. And sometimes it's, it's a combination of both. Sometimes it's performance, sometimes it's behavior. So think about those employees as we're talking today. Do they need a performance improvement plan? Do they need a behavior improvement plan? Or before we get to those steps, have we gone through a coaching process with them where the coaching conversation is pretty regular? It's not a only after things go bad kind of, a, kind of an approach. It's, it's that we're catching people in the hallway. We catch people by phone, by text, by email. We talk to employees over coffee. We talk to employees more formally in our office. We talk to employees in their, in their workspace about specific issues that we see as supervisors where they could use a little bit of fine tuning. They could use a little bit of, a, of an improvement in what they're doing, but it's, a, it's a, a, a casual conversation not designed to put a lot of pressure on them, but it's just constantly fine tuning or asking them to fine tune their approach. And I think that's what good coaches do. And we're gonna go back over and over again to this idea of feedback, not criticism is what employees want to hear. It's like, you know, if someone's ever said to you, I have a little constructive criticism for you, obviously we, we, always, we always get defensive, me included. If someone says, hey, let me give you a little feedback about what I heard or saw or what I'd like to see, it's a little bit easier for them to digest and to make changes to reach that goal as well. So think about that semantic use just of the word feedback. So there are a lot of themes that I think about with this group. One is, is this collection of people, this 15 that we are going to talk about, and these are archetypes, again, meaning the descriptors of people in kind of a broad, generic, uh, and specific sort of way, which is, are we looking at a category of people that exhibit certain behaviors? I would call those archetypes, and we have 15 of those. What is their impact on the business? And so for an employee who gossips, for an employee who is rude to customers, for an employee who interrupts during meetings. What is the impact on the business? And you could say that the impact is substantial or at least demonstrable. If we think about the impact on the business, you as a supervisor or manager must address those concerns that have the highest business impact. Employee coming in late every single day is a big business impact issue. If you can't operate their, their machinery, desk, equipment, software, or whatever happens to be answer telephones because they're not there, that's a big business impact issue. Uh, do we rationalize unacceptable behavior? And the answer is sometimes we do, meaning that we say, well, you know, Steve, I'm not a lawyer or a psychologist or a social worker or a you know, behavior expert. I, I know what I know how to do and what, you know, may, maybe I'm letting stuff go because I don't know specifically how to address it. I think about getting help and support from peers, peer supervisors, getting help and support from your bosses if they're willing to listen to your concern. I'm having a conversation with some people you like and trust and know in the human resources function of your organization. Could be all get uh, you, you could be all useful ways to get some solutions that you can get past this sort of rationalization about what am I supposed to do? Uh, are we looking at profiles or behaviors of these people and that we're talking about this 15? And the answer is behaviors. We're not profiling people. We're looking at archetypes. We're looking at a collection of behaviors that we choose to label in a way that's common for everybody. And that's what an archetype is. Uh, if we look at our goal at work, is it peace or justice? And the answer is peace. We'd like a, an effective um, um, operational workforce that where folks get along with each other. There's a minimum of conflict. There's a, a, a maximum of, of effort and concern for each other and concern for the project or the product that we're, we're uh, moving forward. Justice is really about you know discipline and, and termination and suspension, all this type of stuff. That, those things may be necessary with these, with these 15 at the end stages, but what can we do prior to that with the coaching process? What should you asking for help from colleagues or bosses or HR mean? Not that you don't know how to do your job or that you're not skilled or that you, that you lack the skills to be a supervisor. What it means is that sometimes we have gaps in our, in our skill set. And maybe you have subject expertise in other people around you, peers and bosses and human resources, places like that, that can help you fill in some of those gaps. For example, you know, I have a doctoral degree, but my, my function in the world besides training is writing. And so I'm a good writer, I would say, and, and blogs and columns and articles and, and books, but I'm not a project manager by training and I'm not a budget guy by training. So when I have holes in my, in my knowledge in those areas, budgets, project planning, things like that. I have to go to the experts in my organization that have those, those skills as well. So asking for help should not be a sin is what I'm saying. How do we align with people that we're working with? And sometimes alignment is based on age or race or gender or previous contact, previous experience where you're just a better fit. 
or you're not. And maybe a colleague supervisor, a peer supervisor might be somebody who could provide coaching skills to one of your employees better than you because he's just a better fit or vice versa. You may be asked or could ask a colleague to say, hey, could you talk to this employee? You seem to have a rapport, a connection with this person is perhaps better than mine, but we're all agreement that they need to make some changes in performance or behavior. So maybe you're a better fit with a colleague's uh, employees and vice versa. So don't be shy about the idea of this alignment, who's the best person to have the conversation with that particular employee because it's just a better fit. Uh, I've been looking at, at high-risk human behavior and high-risk human resources issues my entire 30-year career. I started off in workplace violence prevention and I'm still doing that today. Um, there are no consequences of this person's behavior, it's not going to change. And I'm not saying we're running a, you know, a prison yard or, a, or a, a, you know, an elementary school, but the idea of consequences, meaning that we do use oral warnings, we use written warnings, we use progressive discipline as necessary. We use as many coaching conversations as we can until they stop working. And that, for me, is where we cross over into what I will talk about a little bit later called the PAM or the personal accountability meeting. The PAM or the personal accountability meeting is the last coaching conversation we have with employees before we switch over to discipline. It's the last time for them to, for you to say to them, this is the last conversation we will have about the changes in your performance or behavior. The next conversation we have is discipline. Now, why that may be useful is it's now what's called a Weingarten meeting or where the employee is entitled to a union rep in those of you that are in union environments. So I'm not a big fan of punishment, but I'm a big fan of consequences, meaning that there has to be some edge to the limit of coaching conversations before you say, okay, the next step is, is, is progressive discipline because coaching has not worked. And for some employees, they go right up to that edge and others, you only need to have one meeting. Last one, as we are working with people, sometimes you are gonna come across a lot of emotions, either their own or yours. It's not uncommon to have people cry in coaching meetings. It's not uncommon for people to get upset in coaching conversations. It's not uncommon in your supervisory career for you to have to have acting skills, your own sense of patience, your own sense of, of being able to communicate with people who, who get on your nerves, uh, being able to communicate with employees who don't do what you have asked them to do for the 25th or the 250th time can require a lot of patience. And then the last one, how do you prove change in the coaching conversation, how do you prove, uh, prove that you have seen changes in performance or behavior? And the issue there is it might be subtle. It may be uh, a demonstrated change in their um, um, attitude with, with customers over a span of time. Sometimes it takes people a while to get the hang of what you want them to do. If it's a technical issue, there may be some learning curve that they have to go through before they're up to full speed. It may take them three months or five months to get up to full speed. But do we see proof of change? And I guess the thing I'm asking you to look at is, is it episodic or is it continual change or is it there's an aha moment where they sort of get it and it took a couple months for them to get there or it's an immediate change? Uh, for certain things where there are specific behavioral issues like harassing behavior or sarcasm, I don't want a, a yes, I want you to be less sarcastic tomorrow and less sarcastic the day after that. I'd say it's going to stop now. And there are certain things we're going to talk about where the change they need to make is immediate and other times the change, we're going to be seeing a gradual improvement over a span of time. And you have to have the patience enough to allow that to happen. So I oftentimes talk about in the coaching conversation and especially progressive discipline piece, sort of at the other end of the coaching part, what is the big seven? What are the issues that supervisors must address when it comes to uh, supervising and managing employees? It's work performance. It's the quality of the work, deadlines, meeting deadlines, things like that. It's violation of policy and procedure. You cannot smoke in the dynamite factory, right? It is conflict that we see between, between employees or it's conflict with an employee to supervisor or conflict with, with people that they deal with over the phone or face-to-face, -face, customers, clients, things like that. Attendance, certainly an important issue. They get to work on time. They, they manage their breaks and lunches and their sick time effectively and appropriately and ethically. Attitude, which is certainly a label, right? You've got a lousy attitude. What we really need to focus on is what does, what this person's attitude is impacts the business in a negative way. Attitude towards coworkers, attitude over the telephone, attitude towards, towards clients, customers, things like that. Then does this person need an improvement in their service orientation, how they serve other departments, other team members, other colleagues, you. And the last one, 
can they work effectively in teams, small projects, large projects, ongoing uh, things that are necessary that they work in small groups, can they do that with a minimum of conflict and effectiveness? So if I look at the coaching kind of collection here, these are the seven things that I typically see as the areas that you're most likely to need to use coaching for an employee that's, that's, that has significant uh, issues in some of these areas where they're not doing what you want them to do. So think about this big seven and then think about also what we talked about, which is how do we improve in these areas? How, what is the proof in these areas that, that the change is taking place? And you may see a dramatic improvement in their attendance. You may see a dramatic improvement or a slow improvement in their attitude with others. You may see more of a service orientation. You may see them more likely to pitch in and work in teams together. You may see the absence of the policy or, or, or procedure violation that, that got them into your office in the first place. And you may see an improvement in their work performance, how they do their work, how they turn it in, what the quality is, things like that. So <clears throat> since I write books and I work a lot with um, um, managers and supervisors that are, are always looking to grow their bookshelf, I, I think about a book I like a lot, which came out in 02, that I think there's a second edition of this book as well called Crucial Conversations. And what these guys said in this book, these four consultants, and you can see their stuff on YouTube, they've done a number of training videos as well. Uh, there's a really good one that I typically recommend that, that features a guy named Ron McMillan, who's one of the authors, kind of a gray haired guy, he's got a black suit on and a kind of a bright green dress shirt. Uh, that video is about 14 minutes long and you see it on, on YouTube. Uh, he's speaking in front of a large audience and he's talking about this concept. He and the other authors here looked at how people speak with each other and they said about 90% of the time, we are routine, normal, and casual conversations with people, and we do fine with them. About 10% of the time, uh, we will have what he would, these guys would call a crucial conversation, meaning that there's strong emotions, high stakes, and different opinions as to what to do for one or both parties. You may find yourself falling into, accidentally, a crucial conversation with a family member who's upset about something. High stakes for them, maybe not high stakes for you, or strong emotions for them, but maybe not for you or different opinions where you can't agree on what needs to be done, you've just stepped into a crucial conversation. Uh, personally and professionally, these conversations happen all the time with employees, with family members, with people that we love and care about, with people in our professional lives. And what these folks have said in the Crucial Conversations book and in the, in the accompanying YouTube videos is these are areas where we need to have our best conversational skills, our best communication skills, we need to use paraphrasing. We need to step on the brakes and stop and, and ask better questions to figure out what the issue is. Uh, I've had lots of coaching conversations where males and females have cried because of frustration, because of anger, because of, of their just impatience towards the situation. And I get that. Um, oftentimes, if you talk to an employee in your office uh, with the door closed and they're sitting in the employee chair and you're sitting in the boss chair, the stakes are automatically high for them. They think they've done something wrong and they're, they're anxious about it. So it turns into a crucial conversation for them, high stakes for them. And maybe it's just a routine casual conversation for you, but they see it a different way. So look at these three variables, high stakes, strong emotions, different opinions as to what to do. These give us permission to coach. These give us permission to talk with employees about performance or behavior. So I recommend the book and certainly the videos I think are very useful for, especially if you don't have a lot of knowledge of the concept, these guys can fill in your, your gaps. So I look at the coaching conversation with employees, a pre or post discipline conversation about performance or behavior. When would you have a post discipline conversation? I do these a lot. The employee comes back after sexual harassment or racial harassment or some other concern where they didn't get fired. Uh, they're, they're out of the penalty box, so to speak. And I say, okay, welcome back to the organization. Let's talk about how this does not happen again. Let's talk about what you need to stop doing or to make sure that you continue to do differently. Uh, a series of conversations that can employ along his or her uh, uh, career path. So this is a way to help those employees that you see that are, are wanting to promote, wanting to move to a next step level, wanting to move to a, a managerial supervisory uh, job. And then the bottom one, certainly a way to identify skill gaps that you may not automatically know that the employee has, that they may have had for many years. Um, there are training gaps um, uh, that solve conflicts between employees that reward success and make the performance evaluation, your performance evaluation documentation, that process easier. Um, I think a good coaches have coaching files, which is a collection of the employees coaching conversations and their accomplishments during the rating period. It's not a secondary personnel file, but it helps you remember when you do your eval what, what things that you have talked to the employee about and whether or not they have achieved those goals or made those 
changes. So think about that concept of a coaching file. I look at coaching for the pe people we're going to talk about, this group of 15, as having a kind of a corrective uh, notation to it. Typically, that's a lot of the coaching I do. Uh, my dad, the guru, my dad's name is Carl. Uh, my dad's been doing executive and strategic coaching for, for decades. Uh, he works with political leaders and, and top business people around the world. My stuff tends to be more around performance improvement, and especially around corrective coaching. Uh, special problems coaching is typically things that you may make in a referral to the employees, uh, employee assistance program, or you may make a referral to an outside expert that, that has some uh, expertise that this person may need in, their, in their, their personal life without getting into their personal life issues. But certainly career development is about helping this person move to the next level. Performance improvement coaching is really about getting them the job skills, training, exposure to templates, cheat sheets, um, videos, uh, one-day training programs that they need to go to improve their job skills. A lot of the stuff we're going to talk about here would be uh, what I would call corrective coaching, which is the goal is compliance, and there, there's, there's some sort of deficit that's hurting their career, it's either performance or behavior or both. So one of the tools that I use a lot in discussions with employees is Keep, Stop, Start. It's, a, it's an organizational development tool. It's an old-school tool that's been around for a while what you want the employee to keep doing because it's working, stop doing because it's not working, or start doing because it's a better idea. The keep says, keep doing this because it's good for our team, our department is good for you. Stop doing this because it's a waste of time, it's not value-added activity, and start doing this because it's a good idea and it's good for what we're trying to do. You can encourage a keep, stop, start conversation during the coaching discussion with the employee, and if they don't know, they can't think of any ideas, then, then give them some. Um, give them some suggestions. But sometimes they may say, well, I guess I could start doing this, or I suppose I should stop doing this. And if that's correct, then give them praise and say, that's exactly right. Sounds like we're on the same path. Let's, let's talk about what we need to do to fine tune some of these issues. So I use this, this concept, these three parts, keep, stop, start, quite effectively uh, in coaching conversations. So there's the three C's here, and two of them are, are pretty easy to do, the communicate with the issue with the employee, and listen and get their feedback, clarify as so that the person can see exactly what changes you'd like them to make in performance or behavior. The toughest one, obviously, and the toughest one that we mostly um, find the most sort of um, challenge with is the commitment because they only will do the changes that you've made until the heat is off or they will only do the things that you ask them to do until you get distracted by some other issue they believe or and they stop looking at them or they'll do it for a span of time and they're de-evolved back to their usual approach. And so I think about a colleague of mine uh, who's a lawyer up in, in uh, L.A., a guy named uh, Glenn Kramer, uh, K-R-A-E-M-E-R. Glenn Kramer is, a, is an attorney for only organizations. He doesn't represent plaintiff uh, employees. He re just represents organizations. His firm is, is quite well known in, in L.A. And he has what, what I would call a coaching wrap-up conversation, which is, is there any reason? And he asks these questions, variations of these questions. Is there any reason that you can't commit to the changes that we've talked about? Is there anything that I need to help you do that can get you to commit to the changes that we've just discussed? Is there anything that's an obstacle for you to get in the way of making these changes that we discussed? So he really tries to use that last coaching, you know, that last part of the coaching conversation as a pin down as a way to get their commitment. So when they say stuff like, well, I suppose I could do this, or I guess starting tomorrow I'll do this, then you know, if you've ever went fishing, you pull on the fishing pole and you set the hook and you say, that's right. Okay, well, I'm glad you've, you've agreed to that. Let's talk about what that looks like. And I want to make sure that, you know, I can get a sense that you're making the changes that we've seen starting right away. I appreciate your commitment. You know, those types of, of statements to help the employee re realize the necessity to own the changes, own the solutions. So I talked about this concept of the PAM, the personal accountability meeting. It's the, the last coaching meeting before the employee needs a union rep. It's the last coaching meeting before we set, we step into the discipline meeting, which would be the next one. Um, it's a cards on the table. I'm not going to keep asking, pleading, begging with you. I don't do that. I just say, these are the changes I expect you to make. If, if we don't happen by the next time I, I get together with you, I've not seen these changes, then we're going to move to discipline. It's useful for those employees who are just um, fighting you all the way and making changes. Um, it, it's a way for you to control your emotions and not lose your, your temper and, and get, un, you know, say unprofessional things by simply saying this is a PAM. 
this is the last meeting before we, we get to the to the discipline piece. So I'm asking you, you know, is there any reason that you can't make these changes? Is there some kind of obstacle that I don't know about? Because the next time we talk about this, if I don't see the changes, we're gonna to move to discipline. And I like the PAM as an end point to coaching because there has to be one. If we don't see it, then the employee thinks we're just having a chat, we're just having a conversation. Well, in reality, it's it's serious business about performance or behavior changes or both. Okay, let's go through the 15. <clears throat> Excuse me, the bully is somebody, male or female, who could have um, uh, kind of a personality style which uh, dominates people, uh, they're aggressive in meetings, they're aggressive in conversation, they may have some good uh, intentions in terms of energy and enthusiasm and wanting to get stuff done, but sometimes they use ridicule, sometimes they, they intentionally hurt people's feelings, they're sarcastic, they may use physical size difference, they may use age over other people, they may use their tone uh, to be demeaning. Oftentimes they do it because they have really low self-esteem and it masks their own fears and it plus it's work for them in other relationships in their personal and professional lives. I think what we do for the bully is we focus on examples, not, not general guidelines. You can't say stop bullying people because they say I don't. What you say is, hey, when you come in and you dominate a room or you dominate a meeting or you're critical of people in a way that's not useful for them, you know, you use the wrong language, you curse at people, whatever it happens to be, you've got to confront those things with specific examples. And also create consequences and say, you know, this can't continue when you say or do these things that hurts our business. And the last piece is sometimes because of their self-esteem issues, they will respond better to praise. You say, hey, I appreciate the way you did this, this, and this, and point out when they do things well, and then use feedback when they don't. And so it's not a punishment conversation, it's, a, it's an awareness building conversation. And sometimes they know this about their own personality, they may admit it, sometimes they don't. And I think that the challenge with the bully is sometimes the boss can feel bullied by the employee as well. And that's not the way to, to, to be successful with these people. You have to take control of the examples that we use to say this is the stuff that cannot continue. Your type of approach is not going to work in our, our organization. Here, the harasser is of a verbal uh, harassment, of a, of a visual harassment. It's emails or jokes or, or things around people's sexual orientation or race or, or age or anything like that. And uh, they may use the, I was just kidding as their defense. Uh, they may be using sexually harassing or racially harassing language or behavior that really um, goes right up on the edge of, well, I was just kidding or I was just joking around. I think in the year of our Lord 2023, these things are not acceptable at all because it's not 1940. We've had the Civil Rights Act since 1964. No one can say they don't know anything about sexually or racially harassing behaviors. They can't say they don't know what it is or it's never been explained to them. Um, in any job you've ever had from working at McDonald's forward, there's going to be a video, there's going to be training, there's going to be a, an employee handbook. Um, these are behaviors I really um, say we must call out, we must uh, enforce policy, we use one-on-one -on -one coaching, and if that doesn't work, then we move to discipline and termination. You cannot allow these types of people to flourish because what happens is it drives good employees away. They quit, they leave. Um, the other thing I've seen this, this type of person use is, well, it's free speech, I can say whatever I want, and I say, not here. You can't use hate speech here. You can't use uh, speech that harms people's ability to do their job successfully here. You can't pick on people in protected classes here. It's not allowed. So this, this person, like the bully, demands a tougher approach. Uh, there may be more other employees that we're talking about and other typologies here that have more of a, uh, a, a different approach, but these folks, especially these first two, demand a tougher approach by us, oftentimes in con uh, consultation with your boss and or human resources. This person is really a challenge. And from a coaching perspective, the smart slacker is one of the toughest because they know how to work, but they don't want to. They're missing on duty or retired on duty. The only reason they don't fall over is they're wearing stiff clothing. Um, they can teach other employees how to be slackers, which is what are you working so hard for? We all get paid the same, it doesn't matter, we'll do it tomorrow, that type of thing. This type of employee oftentimes um, wants to retire but can't afford it, um, has topped out at the top step, and especially in organizations where there's a step level, they can't go any higher. There's not enough challenges for them. They feel burnt out. They've been there a long time. Uh, one of the things I try to, to do with them is to say, look, uh, you're a legacy employee. You've been here a long time. Or you have a reputation of being really smart technically and quite um, effective in terms of these particular interactions with our clients and customers. And I want to be able to, to rely on you for those things. But you can't do the let's do it tomorrow. You can't 
you can't uh, interrupt and and uh, criticize uh, ideas being an idea killer in meetings like that because it doesn't work for us. And I think that sometimes you know these people are, sometimes have some misery in their life, and they're waiting for a one person retirement party where they can just hand their stuff to human resources and walk out the door and never say goodbye. That's that's happened. I think sometimes a PAM is necessary once coaching meetings have not worked with this employee. And the other thing about the smart slacker, which you may see, is they will become the smart slacker if you have promoted over them. So you were at the same peer level before as an, as an employee and you moved to a, a supervisory or management position and they, they wish they would have got the job or they don't think you're qualified for the job. And as a result, they will constantly undermine what you're trying to do. And I think you have to address that. There's two types of this employee. One is your friend who says, well, my, my boss is now, is my pal now, right? We're, we're old friends from the old days. I don't have to work very hard. Or the other end of the smart slacker is my boss is a person I don't respect or shouldn't have got this promotion. I should have gotten as a result. They're, they're, they're furious about it and they don't work very hard. E either of those are challenging. And as a result, you must have a separate, separate in-person, one-on-one conversation with both to say, look, you know, I, you and I have not always got along, but I respect your your efforts and your work and your expertise. The fact that I got this job, you may or may not like that. I'd like to be able to count on you. For your good friend, you say, look, you, you can't put me in, at, at, at the risk of having to use discipline on one of my friends because you're not working. I want you to work just as hard as everybody else. We're, we're friends outside of work, that's fine, but I have expectations for you here. And so that's kind of the two ways we see of the smart slacker. The one end that doesn't want you to have got the promotion versus the person says, great, my boss is now, you know, my buddy, and they're just as difficult to, to deal with as the other end. The dolphin employee, if you've ever watched the dolphin out of the water and then, then under the water, then out of the water, then under the water, they perform well um, until you stop uh, putting pressure on them to perform well. Uh, they perform well once you stop, uh, it, but then once you stop coaching them, they go back to their kind of old ways. So. They're similar to an employer we're going to talk about called the plow horse. And as a result, they, they may need a lot of your time. And, and what you need to remind them of in the coaching conversation is, look, I expect you to be consistent. I expect you to use the same constant performance. I expect you to give us this level of quality that you've done these past several weeks, but not the type of stuff that you did three months ago where I got on you about quality of your work, attendance, things like that. The dolphin is not very self-motivating. And that's the challenge with them. They're, they're not oftentimes very self-motivating, meaning that they, they work um, um, to a level that you expect or want if you're on them and not if you aren't. And it can be tiring because you say, I have other people I have to supervise. This person does not typically self-motivate very well. And that's the conversation you're going to have to have. Say, look, you know, when I see your level of effort start to go down again, I don't want to be the one that has to come by and constantly remind you. You've got to be able to be more self-motivating. I think that's part of the coaching conversations for the Dolphin employee. This one, the passive aggressive, is probably my least favorite. Sometimes I think I'd rather deal with five smart slackers than the passive aggressive because what happens with passive aggressives is you leave the coaching conversation, you leave the general conversation, you're sort of bugged and you don't know why. Why am I angry? Uh, what happens with the passive aggressives is they're really useful um, tools for them as man manipulation and guilt, and also they def defer uh, what they do. They, they call out other people. They act wounded when you when you call them on specific uh, issues. They redirect blame oftentimes. They turn the blame on to you. Well, you never gave me, or I was never told, or I, I asked you for this training. I never got it. Uh, this has been going on a, a lot of times in their whole lives. And they bug people, and maybe they know it that they do it, and maybe they don't. But I find this this type of person to be really, really draining because you walk away from these conversations going, "Why am I upset?" I I, I tried to talk to them about performance or behavior, and somehow it turned into a guilt trip. Um, I think you call them out with specific examples. I think you you test for truth, which means uh, I did send you that training program three months ago, as you recall, and you don't let them. Um, 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 create scenarios where somehow you're at fault for their their failures. And I think the other part about the passive aggressive is you set a high bar. You ask for high performance from them and you don't deviate from that. You don't let them then you don't let them guilt you into sitting around. You don't let them guilt you into not working very hard. And I think that's the challenge with the passive aggressive. If you've ever had it with a family member or a parent, you know how difficult it can be. The champion is an interesting person. They love to point out 
injustice in the workplace. They see people telling jokes or they see some kind of inappropriate um, um, email that went out. And they, they can go to the boss, you, or to human resources a lot, oftentimes with petty complaints about coworkers that really have no merit. In reality, they do this as a distraction because they're not good at their own jobs. I do a lot of work in public sector, and I see this sometimes with employees who, who um, sometimes have not been trained to do something, so they'll distract with you know the, the pointing out all the injustices in the organization. Sometimes their, their performance evaluations are really poor, and they use this as a way to say, you can't fire me because I'm a whistleblower, and then they get into that whole thing. So I think you have to um, look at their goals, and sometimes their goals is to distract from their poor performance. Other times, um, they want to get you out of the job. They don't like you, and they'll use this as a way to say, my boss is letting harassment go on, things like that. I think you have to use performance improvement plans to confront their typical poor performance by saying these are the things you should know how to do. And the other part about the champion, and this is what I have done in my career, which is if you know that they go and complain to human resources or to your boss or your boss's boss about you, you gave them a poor performance evaluation or you gave them a coaching meeting which they disagreed with, go to your bosses or HR first and say, I'm about to talk to this employee about these specific, specific issues. Their, their failures in these specific projects or their lack of knowledge in this particular um, um, you know, equipment, machinery, software, whatever it is that they're not being able to, to do, they may come to you, boss, they may come to you, HR, with a head of steam, um, furious about the fact that I called them out on these things. I want to get your blessing, so to speak, or your approval to have this conversation, knowing that they may come to you and complain about me, meaning, I want to get there before they they pull the fire alarm and and create all this this drama about a conversation which I know I should have with them. Uh, your uh, bosses and or HR may know about these people already because they've worn out a path to their office to complain about how things are in the organization. If I was to boil the champion down to a phrase, it would be they distract from the fact that they don't do very good work by pointing out all the horrible things that are happening in the organization, harassment, bullying, whatever it happens to be. They may have some validity or merit in their complaints, but they take them to the to the highest level, meaning they, they see injustice everywhere when it's not really happening. I think the other part, when I have had a conversation with a champion is to say, okay, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, you saw these employees talking about something they saw on TV and you, you were offended by it. Uh, I have looked into the issue. I don't think it rises to the level of a policy violation. I'd like you to go back to work. I'd like you to go back and, and get, get busy with the things that you need to work on. Uh, the champion sometimes is not given enough to do. The champion sometimes is is has a little passive aggressiveness to him or her, which means sometimes we we let them kind of operate their own ship instead of giving them more projects and and occupying their time more. As a result, they wander around and see stuff. They gossip about people. It's not great. Speaking of gossip. I came from working for the city of San Diego and the department I worked in, a lot of people gossiped. And, and you know, you can look at a measure in your organization and say, we gossip a lot here, or we don't do it at all. Uh, sometimes when I teach live versions of team building and things like that, I will say to people, think about a number between one and 10 in your organization where you, 10 is we gossip all the time, and one is we don't do it, give me the number. And some people say 11, and some people say minus three, which, you know, which is great. We don't, we don't do that here. Here's the issue about gossip. Not only does it create it creates consequences for people who want to quit or leave. Uh, it creates clicks, the silent treatment, people don't want to talk to each other. It sabotages personal and professional relationships. I've seen it ruin marriages. Um, I, I, I think that gossip is a coaching conversation. I think gossip is where we say to an employee, you can't do that here. Here's some examples of things I've seen via email or things I've heard you say or things that have come to my attention. I want it to stop. It, it, it causes conflict here. I want you to focus on your work and not do this. And I think gossip is one of those behavioral issues that needs coaching. Uh, it's difficult to, to sort of step on this fire, sometimes forest fire, but it's necessary because it has consequences. It drives people crazy. It gets your, your good performers sometimes leave the organization. Psychopath, lots of books have been written about these types of people. They don't, they're not serial killers, but they are uh, abusive to people, manipulating. They're snake-like, uh, they can lie. Um, I think you have to have better boundaries with them. I think you have to have consequences, including use of discipline. Uh, I think you find um, um, a way to say, 
if they're hurt, um, hurting your organization on a regular basis that we consider termination, uh, if discipline has not worked. Um, if you ask clinicians about psychopaths, lying, manipulating, things like that, uh, they say they're almost impossible to treat. Uh, they sometimes recognize that they are this way and sometimes they don't. Uh, but there are some interesting books up there about the psychopathic boss, the psychopathic employee. Doesn't mean they're a serial killer or dangerous. What it means is they have a manipulating approach and it can be very, very difficult to get these folks to change. The injustice collector is kind of similar to the, uh, the champion, which is uh, they are suspicious of other people. They fear that they're being gossiped about. Um, they see injustice everywhere. One of their favorite phrases is, it's not fair. One of their favorite phrases are people are trying to ruin my life and career when that's not actually true. Uh, I see a lot of these people in my workplace violence cases. Uh, they can make threats. They can be ominous. I think if you look at the tools, you try to test with truth. You let them vent, but you control the conversation. Um, you are careful around them and not to encourage this sort of bullying or harassing that sometimes can come their way because they seem to attract that type of a thing. Um, they are difficult to treat as well in a therapeutic environment because they are paranoid oftentimes about life around them, personally and professionally. And so I think you are empathic to this issue, but you are also cognizant of the fact that sometimes um, they see the world in a twisted sort of a way. They don't recognize normal human interaction. They see it as somehow having a, a you know, there must be a catch or must be a reason for this that somebody's trying to hurt them or ruin their career. And I think we have to be careful around these types of people because they're oftentimes quite delicate in their interactions with other people. The smallest thing offends them. Narcissist, uh, I've worked around narcissists. I I'm a situational narcissist as necessary when I'm standing in front of you know 300 people in a room, but um, I'm not one of these types of people that, that tramps on other folks' feelings. Uh, the narcissist thinks the world revolves around them. Again, they are hard to treat in a therapeutic environment. Um, give them praise when they deserve it, but keep things in perspective use reality checks, don't, don't break their spirit, but don't let them stomp on other people or don't let them get into a situation where they use uh, kind of a superiority complex against other folks. I think what happens with the narcissist is um, they feel wounded, their self-esteem is really low, so they double down on the attention, the, you know, the dig me, at, you know, look at how successful I am. I think we're, we use praise effectively for everybody. Um, we, I think we're careful with this population not to um, overly praise them, but, but also to keep things in, in a, a, a realistic perspective. The statue is an interesting employee. They don't engage. Uh, sitting in meetings, uh, they don't engage. They won't share. Uh, they may have ideas, uh, that, but they got shared and they got shut down. And so as a result, they said, I'm not going to speak again. They could be highly introverted or fearful of being embarrassed. They may have a speech impediment. They may have a language uh, barrier. Uh, they were criticized by people in a group or by a supervisor and, and never forgot about it. I think that that instead of saying anybody have anything to you know include in this conversation, you go around the room and no one says anything. You say, you know, meet with them separately and say, hey, um, I didn't hear you talk about some things, but but you know, do you have some concerns that we can talk about for this project that we're working on? I didn't I didn't hear you. You know, I kind of looked at your body language and thought maybe you were you were concerned, but maybe you didn't feel comfortable talking about that. Maybe you meet with them separately and try to use safe questions. You know. Let's, let's talk about what um, challenges you, you see and what, what things I can do to remove those obstacles. And then the bottom line there, look at the last one, don't let idea killers dominate your meetings. Idea killers are the people that, that create the statue because they're embarrassed or they have hurt feelings or they feel like this person who's idea killing won't let them talk about something that's a fledgling idea or a brand new idea. And the idea killers are those types of people that just go around going, we're not gonna do that, that's a stupid idea, it's not gonna work and it creates more of these types of employees where they just sit there and they don't engage. And so we may not be getting their, be our be their best for our, our concerns because they're afraid to talk. That's sometimes where the idea killer needs to be told, hey, stop doing that during meetings, I don't allow it. Hygiene challenge, boy, this is a really tough one. You may have employees that have a depression issue, uh, maybe medication issue. Uh, sometimes I've seen this where I've had to have the conversation where it's about revenge. I'm going to stink in terms of body odor and breath and things like that to get back at people I'm angry at in the organization. Look at it down there at the bottom there. We talk about what psychologists call a care-fronting conversation. We care enough to confront the issue. And we talk about the impact on the business. When you come in and you're not fully clean, when you come in um, in this state, clothing and body odor and things like that, hate to talk about it, but it impacts the business in a negative way. You may need to make some kind of accommodations for ADA, talk with your human resources of folks about this, but sometimes there's a reason for this, which is 
either I don't know why it's happening to me and I, it's a medical concern, or I do know why it's happening and I'm getting back at somebody or I have depression or some other, other kind of issues there where um, um, hygiene becomes a business impact issue. It's not a common thing, but it's a tough one. And that conversation needs to happen. This employee, uh, the challenger, the know-it-all is really tough because oftentimes they're really dominant in meetings. They're dominant in situations where they step all over people. They're a close cousin to the idea killer. Um, they need to be right. And so they have a lot of jealousy towards other people. Uh, I think you have to uh, take them aside and say, you know, I, I need you to think about two pedals here, a gas pedal and brake. Sometimes brake is better than gas pedal. And I'd like you to think about being more on the brake. Uh, peer pressure, sometimes the group group environment can kind of shout them down. We have to be careful it doesn't turn into an argument. But but sometimes they, they like to confront you uh, in, in a public forum. <laughs> We're not going to do that. That's a stupid idea. And then they want to see what your reaction is. When I hear that happen, I, I pull them aside. Say, okay, great. We're going to wrap up the meeting. Uh, Larry, can I talk to you afterward and say, you can't do that in front of the group. It's not good for what we're trying to do. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm hoping you're not trying to embarrass me when I talk about things that I want us to do, but you can't do that in front of the group. And it has to be, these are the close cousins to the idea of care. We have to enforce consequences for these people. Otherwise, not only do they create doubt, but they sort of can split the group. We have some group of people that, small group that believes them and a larger group that believes you. And then it kind of divides the, the intensity of what we're trying to work on. This person's another one, oftentimes in group environment, oftentimes jokes, uh, little comments. They're intentionally disruptive. Sometimes they're, they're hurtful. Uh, they're sarcastic. They try to attention seek. They've done this since they were a kid. I think you use specific examples. And we can also use something called an extinction technique, which is where you ignore them. Uh, they make some, some little joke and you don't go, you know, you, you should stop saying that or, you know, don't do that here because sometimes they just, their satisfaction is knowing that they got your goat. After the meeting, you can have that conversation, but sometimes extinction is I will ignore the I will ignore the comment. I won't make any reference to it at all, unless it's racial or sexual, in which case I'll stop the meeting and say, we need to talk right now. But sometimes these little jokes, little comments, little sarcasms, if you address them, it's like the ping pong ball. It's like the tennis ball. It's like the pickleball, back, forth, back, forth. It, 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 it engages them in a negative way, which they somehow seem to like. Extinction says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even raise my head. I'm not gonna even address what they just said unless you have to, if it's, you know, super egregious. But oftentimes this approach here is done to get um, attention. It's also to sort of kind of like the challenger uh, and kind of like the champion. It's to distract from the fact that they don't know what they're doing or, or they're just distracting people because they don't want to actually have to go and do some work. Pull them aside, coaching techniques, how this impacts the business in a negative way. It messes up our meetings and give them specific examples. When you said this in that meeting, it, it ruined the flow. It, it interrupted what people were thinking about. I want you to stop. These are tough ones like gossip and the champion and things because they don't think they're doing anything wrong and they think you're the bad guy or the bad woman who's calling them out on it. You have to have courage when you're addressing these types of employees with this coaching conversations. So the plow horse is an employee who is a nice person, but they pull the plow until they run into a rock. And once they run into a rock, they sit on the plow, meaning that you give them an assignment and they call someone and no one answers, they just put that file folder away and never come back to it. Somehow, uh, if they're, not, they're nice folks, but somehow they were not told to think creatively. Somehow they were not told to option think. Somehow they were not told to problem solve. And maybe a boss said to them, don't think out the box, and they said, I won't ever do that. So when they retire, they have 122 file folders of half done stuff. Whereas your, your rising star, will jump on things and come up with a solution. This person will say, well, you know, I went to the website and it crashed, so I didn't know what else to do, so I moved on to the next thing. What you have to say to them in the coaching conversation is keep going, keep, keep trying things, reward their self-initiated progress with praise when you see it, but give them chances to say, hey, take a risk and keep moving on the project, I'll, I'll back your play. What happens with the plow horse is, is that they pull the plow, they're nice people, but they run into an obstacle, they just stop. And they'll sit there for two days and, you know, until you come by and say, hey, how's that thing going? And you go, oh, I, I, they, they go, I, I, I didn't know who to call. And you go, well, call this other guy. And they go, okay. Meaning they didn't think about the, alterna the alternatives or the what success looks like. They just thought about the fact that they're stuck and they're just going to sit there until they get guidance. Uh, they can be frustrating to us because the speed and pace of life these days in work means, you know, keep working on it until you get it solved, not sit there until I come by and tell you what to do. So our last one, our plus one, if this was a wedding, right? Our plus one is the rising star or the shining star. 
So we've talked about the 15 that can be challenging, the jokester, the statue, the plow horse, the psychopath, the hygiene challenge, et cetera. But there's also a person who's our shining star. And even in performance evaluation for them, we can have some things they need to improve upon. May, may not be the same as you know somebody who's got really significant coaching issues, but this person can certainly move ahead or get certifications or educational um, um, challenges that help them move in their career if that's what they want them to do. There, there's two issues here with the shining star. One is we can burn them out. We can burn them out by giving them too many things and they, they get exhausted, they're in charge when you're not there, things like that. And the other is we can turn them into teacher's pet, which is they get all the fun assignments. They get the stuff that people don't, you know, would like to do but don't get to. They get to go to training. They get to go to out of town. They get to work on some special project. Be careful that you don't turn your shining stars into teacher's pet. The reason we do this, obviously, is because they are successful when they do. What we want is other people to share the workload and, and create as many shining stars as you can in your environment. So the last thing to think about, when I look at coaching, it starts off in a tutorial or teaching role. As we get better at it and as the employee starts to comply and understand the wisdom of the behavioral performance changes, it's an advisory role that you have. And the last one is the assistant discovery, they figured it out themselves. They know what to do without you. That's what successful supervisors do. You're not always telling people what to do. At the end of this, this process, they figured it out for themselves. So thanks everybody for your time and attention. I wanna talk about influencing uh, before I wrap it up. It's not just you telling people what to do, it is walking the talk. It's about building trust and getting people to follow your directions and your, your approach by being gentle sometimes or some bold other times. That's what walking the talk is all about. So lead from the front, uh, get your hands dirty, don't lie, model consistency, patient, humane treatment of everybody, keep your folks informed and stand up for them with other departments or human resources, your bosses, when it is the right thing to do. So uh, Michelle, back over to you, happy to take any questions. Thanks folks for your time on this subject of the 15 types. Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was a great presentation, very informative. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Somebody referring back to the PAM, um, what about folks who reveal a learning disability or mental health issue during that? Yeah, I guess the issue with the, the those things is you say, what kind of reasonable accommodation might we need to make under ADA? And that's a human resources conversation. Or um, um, your HR people may need to talk to their labor law attorneys and say, what kind of accommodation we need to make about, you know, devices or or, or training or something like that. So that, that might be possible. The, the, the PAM could, you know, uh, un, uh, reveal certain things that you may not have even known about like that. Gotcha. Um, the next question we had is, what is the difference between gossip and reporting concerning behavior? Yeah, I guess uh, gossip is stuff that, that's designed to divide people and to create cliques and to, to you know, kind of mess up people's relationships. It's typically harmful. And the other one, the second example is stuff that tends to be more positive where it actually needs to be addressed if supervisors don't don't get it. I think I think we know gossip when we see it because it's that stuff that typically comes from the same types of people over and over again that get distracted, that don't do their work, and they kind of like to bug other people. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, what is What if the HR director is the gossip or enables the behavior for other team members? Yeah, that's a big challenge. I oftentimes think of, you know, everybody's got a boss and who's the HR director's boss? You know, maybe a board of directors that you need to speak to or the the CEO's office or somebody at the C-suite level because um, their, you know, impact on the business could be quite uh, uh, dramatic and, and difficult at that level in the organization. And I, I've, I've heard that before is, you know, what if my boss is the problem? And I think you have to carefully, you know, choose who you speak to not to put your career at risk, but still to have somebody recognize what's going on. Great. So... Again, thank you all for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht, for your time and expertise today. We hope all of our attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. Be sure to join us on September 26th for, all, for our What's Next with Secure 2.0 webinar. And we thank you all and have a safe day. Thanks, everybody.